Welcome, my name is Kelly. I'm Nathan. And I'm Emma. And this is Fanimated, an animation fan podcast where we get a chance to geek out about our favorite animated media. And today is another week of that's part of our Fanimated gift exchange in which I pair up my favorite guests and make them force each other to watch their favorite anime in this case. <laughs> you hear that, Emma? We're her favorite. Oh, I'm so delighted. I knew it. <laughs> All of my guests are my favorite. Can I say that? <laughs> I'm the middle child. Everyone has to be happy. <laughs> nah, we're the best. <laughs> um, but yeah, you guys are basically amazing, and I'm glad to have you both back on the show. And um, this week, our topic was chosen by Emma. That's me. That's Emma. So, Emma, what are we watching this week? This week, we are watching The Promised Neverland. Woo! Woo! Yeah. <laughs> the, the, Nathan's like, oh. Spooky. Spooky. <laughs> <laughs> the Promised Neverland has been on my list of fanimated topics for the longest time and so I'm so glad yes. that you chose this one because I've been needing to geek out about it for years <laughs> I will say I was being nice on this one I almost I almost Nathan picked just the best cringiest rom-com shoujo <laughs> anime ever I was really tempted but I was like oh should, we gotta talk should. about this it's gonna be so good yeah, you should have gone for it. Yeah, maybe next, next time, year. Next time. <laughs> Instead, we made Nathan watch a thriller horror anime. Um... Ooh, which, not my genre of choice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to pull I, your leg a little bit, you know. <laughs> I like to watch happy shows full of happy people doing cool things. <laughs> so... So yeah, this is definitely uh, a change for you, Nathan. I will say, of course, I love thrillers, and I, um, you know, watch fair amount a fair amount of like horror thriller anime. Um, and so this is like honestly, season one of The Promised Neverland is no joke, still on my top ten um, of all anime ever. Um, I just pretend that season two does not exist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for our purposes, <clears throat> we only told Nathan to watch season one. And that's all I watched. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Good. Um, and so, of course, spoiler warning for all of The Promised Neverland. And I'll, and I'll try to not spoil the manga if you're reading the manga. Um, but definitely the, the first two seasons, only seasons of The Promised Neverland. <laughs> spoiler warning on that. Additional warning? This show is not for kids. <laughs> what? But it has tons of kids. It's marketed towards kids. <laughs> no. Oh. I have a funny it's story about that. It's Jump. It's marketed towards kids. <laughs> Y'all, one time I showed a meme to my seventh graders that involved the promised Netherlands, and they were like, Miss Martin, that is not school appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, definitely, um, you know, viewer discretion is advised, for sure. <laughs> Emma, since this is your, your, your choice, will you give us a quick synopsis of The Promised Neverland? I will do my best. Okay, The Promised Neverland. So, in the middle of nowhere, we have an orphanage. And all the kids there are constantly put through, um, like, tests each day and are just in the middle of nowhere we're not really sure what's going on, but as we go along in the journey, we find out that these children are actually sold to monsters on the outside of the wall. So there's this farm. The orphanage is a farm where the children are being raised to um, be extra smart, and I guess that makes their brains extra juicy or something, but <laughs> then they're shipped off to the monsters and they eat them. So that's cruel and terrifying, but of course we have our wonderful, smart little kids who are like, we're going to figure out how to escape. Now, not all the kids know this, of course, only a couple of them find out along the way and 
as they do, they figure out a plan to rescue all of the kids, and eventually they do succeed mostly. How's that? <laughs> mostly. Mostly. Keyword dot, dot, mostly. dot. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, this is a horror thriller <laughs> where children get eaten. Yay. Not on screen, though, luckily. So it's not like oh, yeah, Attack on Titan. It's a very, yeah. like, it does the horror thing of, like, talk about the monster but never show it really well yes and so mm-hmm. there's this like looming idea that they are uh i watched the i watched it dubbed so no i watched it subbed i always forget what is what i watched it subbed so they're always uh subtitling them as demons so it's the very traditional like yeah. japanese are scared of demons everything's a demon type of thing mm-hmm. of that they rule the outside world that we never get to see Exactly. Right. Yeah, these kids have never seen the outside world. They only know what the information about the outside world that's been given to them, which they assume is inaccurate. And of course, season one only goes up until the escape and not into the outside world itself. So of course, all of that comes into play later. But <laughs> um, for season one purposes, yeah, they don't know anything about the outside world, what they're getting into. They're just trying to, you know, step one of survival is just to escape the farm. Um, and what's so brilliant about it and what makes it so great is that so the, in this season, the first season, they're um, fighting not against the demons themselves or, or the so- demons the society, which comes later, but they're just trying to fight against their caretaker, mother, Isabel, <laughs> and um, like trying to keep her from knowing that they know, you know? And so it's like all these mind games, all these like little like, you know, they often refer to like oh you're like playing chess you know you're strategizing you're trying to figure out a way to get everyone to safety because of course you have your your classic anime trio and (laughs) your classic anime protagonist who's like bubbly and sparkly and sunshiny and is gonna save everybody instead of doing the smart thing which would be (laughs) to just run away (laughs) (laughs) but she's got to save all of them kelly Yes, because she can't lose another another family member. They're all siblings. They really, yeah. she loves everyone. That's her weakness. Her weakness is that she cares too much about everybody. She's too nice to everybody. And this character we're talking about is Emma, Emma. the lovely redhead protagonist. Yes. <laughs> Just saying. No relation. No, no relation, relation to this <laughs> other Emma that's on the podcast who has red hair. <laughs> oh, yeah. So... <clears throat> So let's talk about the main trio. We have Emma and we have Ray, who is our little um, not Ray of Sunshine. And then (laughs) we have Norman, who um, is also uh, – listen, they're the the, the three (laughs) – (laughs) <laughs> they're the three smartest kids at the orphanage because of like we said like uh, if you're smarter you get to live longer basically is the mo of this place and um so they've all made it to the ripe old age of 11 and <laughs> it sounds um, so sad talking about it <laughs> <laughs> i know because they're the oldest ones at the orphanage once you're 12 you get shipped out um and so these are this is our trio this is our main force um against Isabella so obvious I mean I don't want to say obviously but I'm just assuming Emma that your favorite character is Emma but is that true I'm a little tied actually because Emma is wonderful in every way but I do love Ray so much because he's classic like angry boy I love angry boy (laughs) it's true oh man it's true (laughs) but I do love Emma because she's she is relatable, I will be honest. I love her personality and her heart for everyone else, even if it can kind of cause trouble along the way, but she's just so fun. Yeah. What about you, Nathan? Who's your favorite of the trio? Of oh, the trio, Emma. Emma's like the best, is the character. Like, yeah. the, the boys are like, fine, but the boys are <laughs> like, kind of worthless in a certain oh, way. What? What? Okay, no. defend yourself on that one. Defend myself. Um, they're too self-sacrificing to the point of martyrdom, which ends up being very annoying. To, Isn't like, that what Emma is? Self-sacrificing? 
Yeah, but I think she's more genuine about it. <laughs> but, like, Emma's goal is to survive, and neither of the boys' goals are sort of to survive. That's oh, fair. that's true. They're like, if I die, it's fine. Like, yeah, <laughs> because they like... just want Emma to live because they both are in love with her. <laughs> but they're eleven, Kelly. <laughs> There's a weird it's love, juxt- Nathan. It's love. <laughs> fine, fine, fine. <laughs> um, it, but like, I have like endless amounts of like why questions for this show of just yes. like. Why do the kids need to be smart? Don't you know that's a risk? Why? <laughs> Are they, like, so hidden about everything? Why? Like, everything is so contrived and so weird. And so you're sitting there just like, okay, what what's going on? And then in the middle section, everything is a soap opera. They're like, you've betrayed us. What shall we do now? Well, I didn't betray you because I knew all along. No, I couldn't betray anybody because I'm five steps ahead and my betrayal was one of the steps. And you're like, oh my God, everyone, please calm down. Seriously, like it is crazy how much like, especially Norman and Ray, how they are like five steps ahead and you're like, okay, how did you plan that far ahead? Like, I feel bad that I'm an adult and I think maybe one step ahead. <laughs> they like, have to to survive. They have to be five steps ahead. That's fair. Yeah, so they're like endlessly smart, but also 11. <laughs> <laughs> so hey. there's only like so smart you can get as an 11 year old. So like, Unless they're all prodigies. <laughs> like still, it's just like bozos. You're not thinking ahead of like... <laughs> most of your problems sure (laughs) but you're somehow five steps ahead of the soap opera parts of everybody it's like they understand interpersonal like relationships like really weirdly well but anything that they're like no of course there's going to be the 60 foot gap over the 40 foot wall like they don't think about it yeah like it's just like, of course it is there, dudes. Like, what I, are you even attempting? But remember, their worldview is so small. Like, they literally have never left this house in this, like, area. This yeah. like, very yeah. confined space. So, of course, like, they didn't, you know, even though they're so smart, they have limitations, of course. Right. I mean, all their life has been relationships because they're just literally hanging out with the kids every single day. Like, that's that's what they know. But yeah. I love the soap opera aspect of it because what is crazy about the show is it's not thriller in the sense of like you see, you know, gore and monsters, but it's just that mental game that's going on game. constantly. Just constant suspense between the kids and Isabella. And Isabella, by the way, is one of my favorite villains of all time. Yes. Love her. Hmm. I hate her, but love her. I hate and love her. (laughs) Uh, You know why? Because I, okay, so Isabella is a human, and yes, she is, she is knowingly raising these children to die, but she was also raised in the system, and I, I appreciate her because of her, like, place in this world of, like, um, I don't know, like, in her head, she's, like, faking her own, like, fantasy of I at least I get to like be with these kids and like treat them well while they get to be here because like in her mind there is no other place for humans to be in this world except as animals yeah well I think she's just trying to survive like they are exactly you know it's either you got shipped off or you could be a mother and yeah you know if you can survive yeah then that's the best bet it's all about survival. What are your thoughts on Isabella? Uh, I wouldn't say she's my favorite villain. She plays such a small role for so much of it, it seems, mm. um, to me to like truly be one of the greatest villains. But also, I kind of like campy villains, and she's like a very like realistic, yes. sinister person, yes. which is like a little bit too scary for me. Like, <laughs> sure. like, I like the Joker. He's kind of goofy, like, yeah. <laughs> and so, like, when you're like compared to like, essentially, but like, the own the very interesting thing, and you've mentioned it, is that like Isabella isn't this like true evil villain that is doing evil for evil's sake. 
she's an anti like villain where she is doing evil things because she thinks they are good. Um, and so that is interesting, but because she is not one of like the main characters that isn't really like developed yeah. throughout the story until the very, very end. Very and then it's kind of thrown in there. And yeah. then I'm kind of like, why was this thrown in here? More why questions. I don't, why <laughs> did we get her backstory? And then they leave. Like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, <laughs> well, season two delves more into Is- Isabella, a little, Isabella a little bit. Um, I, have not got I have not finished the manga, so I cannot tell you how much Isabella is like actually in the manga versus season two. But season two, there's even more, for sure. Yeah, but her ending is just awful. Yeah, no, <laughs> in it's season not. Two. I mean, you know. And yeah. It's a horror thriller. I don't <laughs> expect any of them to have nice endings. And that was one of the things that was like sitting there and weighing in the back of my brain is like in this genre, there are not nice endings. Like I never expected them to succeed at any point hmm. throughout this story. Yeah. Like, and that was like really difficult for me to watch it, knowing that of mm. like, this genre will not let these kids succeed. Like, sure. there is no way that they can accomplish this task and yeah. get everybody out and everyone lives happily ever after. Like, that does not happen in this genre. And yet, there's hope. Because <laughs> Emma is hope. <laughs> oh my god! And so yeah. So then, like, that was so tough to watch. But then, I have in my notes here, like, episode twelve was so good. Hmm. Episode yes. twelve, like, <laughs> redeemed most of this show for me. Like, I'm sitting there being like, "Why did Emma suggest for me to watch this? This is endlessly sad. Is this punishment? What did I do? I know <laughs> I broke Emma a lot." <laughs> come on give me give me a nice show for christmas please but um it, it was a good show to watch we watched it around like the halloween time so it had that like very yeah. nice Ooh, spooky vibe of halloween at that point for sure but like i'm sitting here and i'm taking some notes and i took notes halfway through of like at the very beginning of the show i knew what the show was about before going into it and i'm really glad that in the first episode they expose the problem of the mm-hmm. kids are food and being kind of raised and killed and so i know the genre of the show i expect them to essentially just like pull as much tension as they can over endless episodes with nothing really happening and they did that for a while so at episode six i'm like all right here's how the show's gonna end because it's all been very predictable so far and i'm like listing these notes and so like some of my predictions were yes. like, oh, nothing's really going to happen to episode seven. I don't think uh, their escape is going to fail. They're going to get pulled back. I'm going to be surprised if everyone survives. Um, and then, like, very pessimistic, didn't expect anything to work out. <laughs> and I'm, like, completely wrong on all of these accounts. <laughs> um, You've watched too much Attack on Titan or something. <laughs> Man, don't it's get gone. into that one show. I'm not watching that show anymore. It's too bad. And so, um, but like, same. Here, here's one prediction though that I think you will both find kind of humorous. Remember, I wrote this around episode five or episode six. So uh-huh. I said, Emma is so difficult to watch because she will never win. None of them <laughs> will. She's going to be broken. <laughs> Nothing breaks Emma. <laughs> And then in two episodes, they fail, and Mother breaks her leg. leg. And it's like, I didn't mean that she would physically be broken, guys. (laughs) Yeah, she was physically broken. And that, oh my gosh, that episode, like, my jaw was on the floor. I mean, my jaw was on the floor for this whole show, but, like, like, yeah, it's their low point in the season one of like everything has gone wrong. Isabella knows that they're knows that they know. She's on to everything. She breaks Emma's leg, so they're like completely stuck. And then Norman gets shipped out. Yeah. And so I was right that they weren't gonna get everybody out. Yeah. But I, I kind of expected Norman and Ray to like uh, tr- try and sacrifice themselves for Emma yeah. constantly, and then have to have 
the other component bail all of them out. <laughs> and so I was expecting whoever didn't survive Ray or Norman to bail out like the rest of the group. And so I think episode 12 is such a great redemption for me because it isn't that. It's Emma bailing everybody out again and then also making the ultimate decision to leave the little kids behind, mm -hmm. which was like one of the biggest sticking points throughout the entire show is that Ray and Norman were like, you have to convince Emma that she can't take the little kids. You it's can't not take the work. babies. Yeah, you can't take can't. the kids under five. They're not fast enough. They don't have the agility. They can't do it. And like, that's a whole thing. And Emma's just, no, we're taking everybody because I'm going to save everyone because I can't live in a world where everyone isn't together. And then Emma comes back at the very end and is like, I, I know this isn't going to work, but I can't make that decision. Let's find a five-year-old and explain everything to it. And I forget the kid's name. Phil. It's, it's Phil. Phil. Phil is my favorite. Phil. <laughs> Phil is the best non trilogy hero. So when you were like, who's the best character? Phil. Phil. Phil's the best Phil. character. Phil is the best character. <laughs> it's not even a comparison. Yeah. And so when they explain everything to Phil and he's like semi-traumatized, but he had been watching them this entire time and knew something was up because Phil is like the next prodigy. Like Phil is the next Norman Ray Emma. And so when he when he like realizes everything, Emma's just like, so what would you do? And Phil's like, come back for us. Like he he knew that it, he was in the same boat as like Ray and Norman. And so he's like, they aren't going to like ship us out for a couple of years. You have a bunch of like time to figure it out, a plan to break everybody out mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. And then Emma goes, all right, we can do that. And then like that is Emma bailing everyone out including herself out of her own predicament and that's like really why emma's the best character yeah, um, yeah. and then she saves ray again from being an absolute <laughs> dolt like, okay okay i need to stand up for ray though because i did make him as one of my top 10 best boys um here's yeah. the thing i love ray because like he he had to like norman is naturally super smart Emma is naturally a really quick learner. Ray just knew about the secret the whole time and had to work his little butt off. Like he, and he had to live his entire life with the threat of like knowing what's going on and like mm -hmm. on edge about what's going on. So of course he's turned into angsty sad boy because he's <laughs> like his whole, like he's lived this whole life that he knows is fake. Right. He's been I holding love onto that truth his entire life. Yeah. I love him. I absolutely love him. He had to work really hard to get to where he was to set everything up so that they could even have a chance. Mm -hmm. And that he was the, like, um, traitor slash, you know, not a traitor. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, so I have to stuck, stick up for Ray. Also, he gets, like, he, uh, for me, it's just, like, especially reading the manga, like, and, and I think it's in the anime, too, season two, like, more, like, Emma, you know, changes Ray because, like, Ray was so, like, there are so many times in the story, at least in the manga, like, Ray has changed. He evolves. He, like, Emma, Emma's positivity, like, has really affected him. And so he, too, is, like, truly, deeply believes that they can try to get everyone out like they can try to make this work and obviously he's still more logical than she is like <laughs> you know she like Definitely. she continuously is a little bit like head in the cloud sometimes and so he's much more realistic and yes continues to be more self-sacrificial but like that's the thing too is that she changes him to be less self-sacrificial like because he's constantly doing the whole like I would rather die and whatever, whatever, whatever. And there's this great part after they escape, spoilers, season two in the manga, um, they get chased by demons. And so Ray, of course, is like, I will lead them off and everyone else will be safe. And they get saved by some other demons and blah, 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 long story. Basically, Emma is like, no, you can never do that again. Like, literally, it's like such a great scene. It's such a good scene because, like, <laughs> Emma's like, no, you're my family too. You know, like, you can't 
like I want everyone and that includes you you know what I mean and it's just like it shifts something in Ray and like from then on he is just like yeah no yeah yeah like I am important too like my life is important too and I'm like yes it's important too right <laughs> you're important right it's important I love him he is my sweet precious baby boy and for all that he's had to suffer with, the truth that he's had to know for year, his whole life, like, of course, he's going to be the pessimist and think, like, we can't save everybody. But he, it's like he almost feels a need to self-sacrifice because, like, that will give him worth or will make him, like, seem like a good person. Um, whereas Emma, she's, when she does self-sacrifice, it's just for the sake of everyone else. Like, I want us to be okay and to move on together um so they just come from different places oh it's so good and um of course like emma with norman gone like it's really like emma and ray against the world and it's and it's just really great and i love them and i i you know i just i love i love all the kids and of course they make you love all the kids so much (laughs) <laughs> Emma, is that your little shipper heart? Yeah. For Emma and Ray. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, a, they're 12. <laughs> hey, hey, okay, I get it. I'm aware. But, you know, if they continue to be friends one day when they're older, they might realize, hmm, yeah. I like you. <laughs> it could happen. For now, all right. they're all siblings and they're just get, trying to survive. They don't have time for romance. Oh, um, don't say that they're all siblings. That makes it worse. Oh, <laughs> that's how they self-define themselves as siblings. Ah, uh, now it just got weird. <laughs> okay. You made it weird, Kelly. Would you have to make it weird? <laughs> all right, no shipping um, for the rest of this episode. <laughs> all right. Okay um, then. Yep. All right, Captain Emma. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on, I suppose. Um, but yeah, like keeping it in season one real quick, like I, it really is still one of my favorite like shows ever because like, especially after reading a lot of the manga, like it is a different experience watching the anime versus reading it. And like, because I've said this before, like in a comic, in a manga, you have the visual, you have the dialogue, you have that. But what's different in a TV show and why I like anime better and animation, obviously, because I just like animation. But also, you have two things that are different. One is timing. The timing is controlled in a TV series. And two is the music. And those two things are just done spectacularly well in this show. And I was even looking through the first volume here and comparing it to the first episode. And also just the direction, like the like the way the camera moves is like they use quick changes of um like camera changes to different cameras they do a lot of pov shots so it's like you're suddenly from way up in the ceiling looking down suddenly you're way down in the like looking up at them from the ground or they do this thing a lot where they that to add that to the suspense your your pov shot is going like through the window into the scene or Mm -hmm. through a little crack in the door into the scene. It's almost as if if, like all those POV shots are like someone else is watching them constantly. Us. It's us us. watching them. We're We're watching watching them. Somebody's eyes are watching. And so I really, so I really do love the anime specifically. Obviously I think the story is fantastic and the art is fantastic. Like in the manga, like the source material is fantastic. But why I love the anime is because all of those things are just implemented super, super well. And the music is great. And like every time it plays the theme, you know, the Isabelle's lullaby is just like, Mm. ah, and things are happening. (laughs) I, I agree with all your points, but there is one thing. Anime babies look weird. That's true. <laughs> they do. What? Why, why can't, can't we get that right? <laughs> why can't animators animate babies in that style? <laughs> They're just like shrunken adults. <laughs> well, Nathan, that that is what babies are, you know. Babies have different proportions, though. These are like shrunken adults with bigger heads, which is what babies are. I don't know. They just look so weird. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Um, th- that's true. I always think their ears look weird, but that's just me. 
Yeah, mm-hmm. their ears are definitely emphasized in this one particularly. Yeah. And well, maybe that's important. because they have to chop they their ears off. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta chop their ears off, not actually. There's, there's <laughs> trackers in their ears so that they yeah. can't leave the farm. So one of the biggest problems is they have to figure out how to break the trackers in their ears to everyone confused about why we're talking about their ears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, you know... Ugh, so many things, so many, op- they, they just have so many obstacles they have to overcome to, 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 to get out. And it's just great see it, seeing it all come together and being on the edge of your seat about it all. It's great. It's fantastic. And, and, un- and, you know, unlike other thriller, like sometimes it's like, I'll watch a thriller once and it's really good. And then I can't rewatch it. And it's not the same because obviously, you know, what's happening. And so the suspense isn't quite there as much, but I've rewatched this one like four times and it's good every time. So, <laughs> yeah. I will say I appreciate it the most because of the setting that I watched it in. Because when I watched it, it was like me and Kelly binged it. um, And it was like dark out and quiet. Mm. And so all you could hear is the soundtrack of the anime. And we were just like watching episode after episode. And it's just like when a scare happens, you're like, oh my gosh. (laughs) Oh my gosh, yes. And did we watch it all in one sitting? We did. He did. <laughs> oh, jeez. I it could not have done so that. It was so fantastic. Like, it was such a suspenseful ride. Because, like... You couldn't turn it off. Yeah, you can't. You can. Because it's just like, oh, my God, what's going to happen next? And then, like, you know, what I love about this show is how it builds on those clues along the way. Like, what was the symbol in the book? I was trying to the remember owl. that. Was, the owl. And then yeah. there was Morse code around it. Right. Like, that was just so fun. Like, piecing all those things together. Yeah, how it all came, comes together at the end. Mm-hmm. It's so good. And also what's fascinating about this story and, like, brings us into kind of season two stuff, which I'll, I mean, we can mention, obviously. We have to mention it a little bit. But, like, season two and also the manga, like, the source material at least. Season one is different than everything else in the show. <laughs> because at, from then on, it, it it's still thriller horror. There's more horror because they're interacting with the demons more. And B, it becomes like this thriller horror survival game, basically, you know. And so obviously the first one is like that too. But the first one is so contained into this very small world of the house, of Gracefield House. And like, then suddenly they're like dealing with all of these other elements and it becomes this whole big world. And there's like politics and there's like, you know, is there a safe place for humans, et cetera, et cetera. And it becomes even more like your traditional, like, shonen j- jump anime. Not that it, this is not really a traditional shonen jump anime at all. <laughs> but, like, it becomes more of that, like, we're going to change the world kind of idea rather than we're just going to survive. Um, it builds into that because there's, like, they need to find a place for humans to live um, and and be. And, and there are some demons who aren't eating people and... You know, it, it's your typical, like, not all demons are bad. <laughs> really? <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> I did get, that, like, that weird vibe of just, like, is this a commentary on, like, the meat industry? Hmm. <laughs> the author has has commented on that and said, um, basically, no, not at all. But if you want to take that stance, you can, basically. But he was like, <laughs> no. A lot of it apparently is just, like, influenced by like his own nightmares as a child and like Hansel oh, and Gretel. Oh, oh great. Yeah. <laughs> That's terrifying. <laughs> Watching someone's nightmares put to animation. It's so good. Why? <laughs> oh my goodness. Mm. Those are some scary dreams. It's scary. Yeah. Uh season 2 is definitely way less of a thriller in my mind. Like it feels more almost like an adventure uh mm-hmm. genre because um they're really just trying to survive and make relationships with the people that they can and it's not it didn't feel suspenseful to me like the first season did like like you said kelly it's just that contained space and there's like no room to run Mm -hmm. um it kind of gives you like i feel like season two is like the scorched trials of maze runner like if Mm -hmm. you're familiar with the series so (laughs) yeah for sure and and season two is infamous for just how truly horrible it is yes <laughs> because um the season two of the anime goes off book from the its source material like completely 
Um, they kind of like keep some things at the beginning, but then they do a complete like U turn. It does its own thing, and I agree with most people that it sucks. <laughs> <laughs> it's really bad. Um, it it doesn't feel like it's part of the same like story at all like it feels very like slapped together the ending is just atrocious it doesn't make sense it it, like none of it makes sense it feels very like cliche and basically like it was basically attack on titan like nor norman comes back and is like i'm going to kill all of the demons spoilers (laughs) (laughs) i said spoilers for the end couldn't have predicted that at all. That was actually one of my predictions. Was oh, okay. actually, Norm, Norman's, Norman's not dead. still alive. Norman, and guess he, he is a dark horse now. Norman was clearly still alive due to the fact that he had no on-screen death. Of course, he's coming back. Of course, he's coming. Back. It's the classic Goody Two Shoe becomes like almost the bad villain. boy. Like, yeah. <laughs> he basically, yeah, he gets tortured and then he's like. Basically, because he's, he's so smart, he he's uh, he helps these other humans escape from the experimentation lab or whatever, and then he decides, like, they all decide they're this little group of rebellious humans who are going to, like, literally, like, co- like genocide the entire demon race. Yeah. Um, and of course, Very Emma is like... Attack on Titan. It's Attack on Titan. Yeah, it's basically Attack on Titan. And then Emma's like, no, Norman. They're good ones. <laughs> yes. That's what's crazy is like you spend this whole time like trying to get away from the monsters and then suddenly like you interact like you're hiding around the village and you see that there's like, oh, like kid monsters or demons with their with their mm-hmm. dads and moms and they're living their normal everyday lives and it's just like, oh, like we shouldn't kill all of these demons because they have lives too, which I get, but it's just like... It just completely changes course of what yeah. where season one was. Um, so it's just like, wh- why? Okay, what? How does this fit? <laughs> yeah, and for you, Nathan, and others who haven't watched season two, basically, well, the reason they give it for like the demons eating humans is basically like, if they can eat humans, then like naturally the demons will turn more and more into monsters, and like like they won't have the uh, like sentience and so they eat humans in order to keep um from turning into real like just beasts um and so that's the idea and it's it's a very like coveted thing in their society like it's it's um like obviously the the access to human meat is like (laughs) held by those in power etc (laughs) etc i know just talking about this is weird (laughs) but there are some quote-unquote vegans as well (laughs) there are some quote-unquote vegans but they're slowly like losing their brains from their vegan well she's got it (laughs) but uh, yeah and then but there is this this, there's this special secret princess though you forgot about there's Uh, always a special secret print come on guys give me a (laughs) Give me a normal show. Why? What do you mean? And it's totally normal. We're throwing all the stereotypes your way. Yeah. This is... <laughs> or not the stereotypes, the tropes, I should say. There's one demon with special blood that, like, if shared to the other demons, they basically can become immune to turning into beasts or whatever. Um, but, of course, their society has, like, um, tried to hunt her down because they want to be... If they control the meat supply, they control the power. And if everyone didn't need the meat, then they wouldn't be in power kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Of co- Basic okay. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of politics. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot of politics. Um, but then it's also still like them trying to survive. Anyway, basically, season two sucks. <laughs> <laughs> but we talked oh, about it for 20 the, minutes on this episode. But the worst part is, okay, the worst part is the last two episodes, the wrap up, Everything happens so fast that you're like, okay, you just look like, it looks like you just needed to end the show. That's and, honestly what they needed to do. And um, my least favorite part, I know we're geeking out about this, but I just have to express this. My <laughs> least favorite part is Isabel suddenly is just like, you know what? I'm going to fight for you children and I'm going to join your side and help you out. And I'm like, what the? What? <laughs> no! <laughs> Well, here's the, th- here's the thing on that. I have, in my predictions as well, Isabel was always in on it. 
because of the story where she is Ray's mom. And so she always wanted Ray to escape. And so that is why she did all mm. of the things to help Ray yeah. inadvertently to escape. Uh-huh. So somewhere deep down, she did always want them, want to, them escape, to survive, but wanted uh-huh. to do it in such a slight and sneaky manner that she would also still survive and be immune yeah. from it. And so it was always about her survival. Her manipulation is so sinister and creepy, though, that I'm like, how do you have good intentions? Like, ugh. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but I, I don't know how Ray focused her intentions are, but definitely, like, maybe that's part of it. But, but we haven't even gotten to the best part of season two. <laughs> I thought this was about season one, and I thought this was a show about <laughs> things we liked, guys, called I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's so hard to not talk about it. It's like the elephant in the room. Like, I have to talk about this show. Listen, I still love the show. I just, season two is buck wild, and I need to tell you about it, Nathan. Okay. okay. All yes. right, we'll sit here and listen. Okay, this is my final thing on season two. Um... And again, I don't, I haven't finished the manga. I don't know how much of this is in the manga. I don't know. But basically, there, there is a human world that's basically our world, and it's just a different dimension, and they go to the other dimension to the human world. <laughs> they full metal alchemist it? What? <laughs> this is just every anime show. What is happening? <laughs> And so at the end, the end, it's like you see like Phil and what's his other face like on a subway. And it's just like, what are they doing? Oh, no. No wonder it sucks. They full metal alchemist it. Yeah. <laughs> they pulled a full metal. <laughs> they pulled a full metal. Anyway, we will stop talking about season two. Yes. It's buck wild and weird. It's um, crazy. But the manga know. is great, yeah. Also, obviously, everyone's mad that season two didn't go into the goalie pond arc in the manga, which, yes, I agree. Mostly just because they do find a- another human out in the <laughs> outside um, who was also an escapee with all of his siblings, but all of his siblings died, and so he's been living alone um, and, like, bitter and alone, and now he's, like, in his 20s and so he's their mentor and i love them so much because of course he's like i hate these kids and then of course like he turns into their dad and it's so <laughs> classic Didn't do that you're one. my dad now <laughs> and he he gives these 11 year olds guns and they just... <laughs> sorry what <laughs> to survive of course yes because <laughs> he's like you gotta survive it's great oh my god how did he what yes. this show brings yes, up Nathan. so many questions yes. many yes. of which yes, it does don't need answering <laughs> <laughs> exactly so season one <laughs> y'all i just love this show i love this story so i love good. this manga everything about it is great um season but yeah season one is it's is kind of a different thing and that's why i just see it as something separate than the rest of the story because it's wild <laughs> all right yeah. i'm i'll stick with my season one watch Great. it was okay <laughs> all right we'll avoid season two yeah. i don't need all of my questions answered because <laughs> it doesn't sound like they answer most of them <laughs> <laughs> well if i you know i'll eventually finish the manga and then and then we can go through all of your questions and see if i learned anything <laughs> about this weird <laughs> world okay yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but season one really is just so incredible. I would say that this show is probably one of my top anime as well, just because watching it had me on the edge of my seat the whole time. Mm-hmm. Like, I was constantly wanting more. And um, I know you said this a while back ago, but, like, you were talking about the camera angles, and, like, that was a huge part that I thought was so artistic that really just drew the audience in. Like, I remember a specific scene where the camera was, like, waving back and forth as it was going up the stairs. Mm -hmm. And, like, you're turning a corner and then suddenly there's a person there. Like, it's just so artfully done. And so I really appreciate the storytelling of this anime. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's really phenomenal. As of this fall, 2022, there have been over 41 million copies sold of The Promised Neverland, including digital. So that's quite a bit. Um... Season one of The Promised Neverland still holds 100% on Rotten Tomatoes, by the by, which obviously Whoa. it's great. 
Um, also, I read that there is a live action series in development for <laughs> Amazon Prime, oh. um, directed by none other than Rodney Rothman, who you will recognize from Spider Man Into the Spider Verse. What? It has to be good then, right? I don't know. I have uh, I my expectations for anime live action adaptations are zero. Well, I think I remember seeing the casting for it and everyone was like, "Those are adults. <laughs> what are you doing?" <laughs> Yikes. Yikes. Like they definitely casted like adults that were, they were going to scale down to like teenagers for it or something. But also sure, Yeah. My memory might be fuzzy on all of this, so yeah, mm, doubt my words. Sure, sure. I just feel like this would be not ideal to be live action only because, like, the fun part is that it is anime and it's kids, and I feel like if you make it into a live action, it's just going to feel like another dystopian movie, which yeah. there was a couple of years where, like, dystopian novels and movies were just the rage and mm -hmm. it's just I don't know it can get old if, depending on how you play it yeah and this isn't Hunger Games you know what I mean like even right. though yeah we're making it sound like it maybe it kind of just the genre <laughs> but like it it's more fantasy than dystopian you right. know what I mean and it's much more spooky than Love Triangle oh yeah Absolutely. for sure yeah but for if sure. it were put into live action I feel like that's how it would come across is like love triangle and dystopian right they would just of... americanize it into the, exactly. the typical dystopian don't do it <laughs> oh no well... and it becomes every genre and every story <laughs> <laughs> just if they were gonna make a live version. action then do season two <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah seriously oh my gosh <laughs> oh man so i thought that was interesting but yeah um the Promised Neverland, if you like spooky things, or if you have friends like Nathan who force you to watch it, then you should watch it. <laughs> well, technically, I force Nathan to watch it. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. <laughs> You're, I guess. may have been torturing you just a tiny bit, just because I mm -hmm. knew horror and thriller was not your thing. <laughs> yeah. You're probably, you survived. Yeah, I survived. And... I've watched, like, gruesome anime, but I, I really hate that, like, suspenseful sitting there in your <laughs> gut feeling. Like, I do not enjoy that, and I don't want to watch things that make me feel that way, which sounds like the opposite for you two who enjoy that and want that feeling. And so I understand and I, like, can see how it is a great uh, anime and how people are highly recommended, but it is not going on any of my top ten lists. <laughs> That is all right. That's okay, because it sits well on mine. So, <laughs> um, yeah, um, that's that's the Promised Neverland. There you have it. Can I also say real quick mm -hmm. that the soundtrack behind this anime is also very good. Like so with good. the opening song and everything, like it's so haunting that it just that's another thing that just pulls me in is because it's so haunting. <laughs> So haunting, so good. All the sound effects, like at the end of se <laughs> the end of episode one, where they're like building up the theme, and mm -hmm. at the end, and Emma's all hopeful, and then they just like cut the music, and it's just Isabella looking at the bunny. Yeah. <laughs> then you're like, oh shoot, oh no, oh no, oh, shoot, stuff's going down. I love it. I love it. Um, also, that reminds me, the OPs and EDs for this show are hype. Yes. <laughs> They are, they are real good. If one good thing came out of season two, it's that opening. <laughs> oh my gosh. The opening is so good. I can't get enough of it. Not only the song, but also just the visuals. And I, I will say, I totally, from the very first time I saw that opening, I called it that Norman, like in, in the opening for season two, there's like, it's like Emma and Ray, Emma and Ray, they're doing their thing, whatever. And then I'm just like, this doesn't look balanced. They're going to add Norman into it halfway through the season. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yep. And they did. And so halfway through the season, when Norman shows up, the, the opening changes and they put Norman in those holes that I totally saw. 
Yeah, well, one of them was, like, all their shadows lined up, but there was a specific, like, blank space in between. Like, it was like, someone's supposed to go there. Yes. <laughs> and I will say that was pretty cool. Um, so with that, thank you, Emma, for choosing The Promised Neverland. Finally got that out of the bucket list of things to talk about for the show. And thank you all for listening. Um, you, of course, can support the podcast by going to patreon.com slash fanimated. Thank you to everyone who supports over there. You truly, like, just, it. without you, this show would not happen. Um, you can follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at Fanimated Podcast. And don't forget to leave a rating and review. If you're on Apple Podcasts, please leave a late rating and review because I haven't gotten one in a little while. It makes me a little sad. Um, if you're on Spotify, you can also rate. And um, thank you to everyone who's done that. Um, got my Spotify wrapped this year and we're at like 4.7 out of 5 stars. So thank you for rating us on Spotify. The music is written by Jamie Krause and the art is done by myself. You can find me on Instagram at CanderDraw. And we'll be back next week to discuss Nathan's choice. What will it be? Um, it's a secret. But I will <laughs> say, just like this show, it's another shonen anime that Cloverworks might have a hand in. Uh, we'll talk to you next week. In the meantime, stay tuned and stay animated. Any questions, comments, concerns before we begin? My bedtime's nine. I've been turned into a cow. Can I go home? <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. And yes, we are going to try to keep it to nine. Yes. It, it won't happen. It's, it's not going to happen, but we're going to try. Nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. Nine fifteen. <laughs>